Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, sitting down to have a chat about that very surprisingly transparent Phil Spencer interview that's been going around. I know Phil's always been a pretty open guy, but as time has gone on, I've detected a bit of some of the cycled PR statements over and over, but this one was a surprising deep dive into all the things involving Redfall's release, the quality bar, how Xbox is analyzing things internally, what they expected for Redfall versus what they got out of it so far. Also, we're going to talk about Starfield, summer showcase expectations in the terms of what games may or may not be there, and how Xbox is adjusting to this overall brand new situation that they have put themselves in. There's a lot to go over, so let's not delay further. This will undoubtedly be a pretty meaty video because I got 11 different clips from this interview to go over. And I got to say, there are certain points I strongly disagree with the mindset at Xbox, and I found it a little disappointing. I'll specify when, but ladies and gentlemen, if you're new here, you're into Xbox news and information, consider subscribing. Usually the, the visual and background setup is better, but I need my notes and the actual interview clips here in front of me. So that's why I'm doing a webcam video at the computer. But thank you so much for your support as we're ramping up, heading into the summer showcase where there's going to be a lot to talk about. But ladies and gentlemen, let's get into clip number one, shall we? One thing I'll fight is kind of uh, what went wrong. There's clearly quality and execution things that we can do. But one thing I won't do is push against creative aspirations of our teams. I know a lot of people will say, hey, you've got teams, teams know how to do one kind of game. Just force them to go do the one kind of game that they have a proven track record for. Um, and I'm just not a believer in that. I want to give the teams the creative platform to go and push their ability, push their aspirations. Um, but I also need to have a, a great selection of games that are continue to come that surprise and delight our fans. And we under delivered on that. And for that, I apologize. It's um, not not what I expect, not what I want. Um, but, you know, it's ours to deliver. I thought this was important to see because it sets the tone, I believe, properly for the mindset at Xbox and Xbox Game Studios. This very much free and open creative environment. We've heard with a ton of these teams that have been acquired that the main reason they sold off to Xbox is because there was an agreement to a lack of involvement, to kind of pursue what you wanna pursue and to create a very diverse portfolio. And we've seen that with, I think, Obsidian being our best standing example. We know the RPGs that have made their name. However, last year they dropped Pentiment and Grounded, famously so. And so it's been nice to see Obsidian do a lot of different things, but still know that they're working on Avowed. And there's been multiple pickups over on LinkedIn of multiple Xbox game studios working on multiple projects. And so it's not just the one thing you typically expect from one company, but multiple different genres like Hi-Fi Rush from Tango Gameworks. So I like the mindset here. I like that he agrees the reception has been disappointing. It's uh, one of the few times we've seen Phil in a pretty sour mood, uh, but this again is interesting because I talked about on Defining Duke how some of my disappointment was with Arcane, and I know it's very taboo in today's industry to point at the developer, the, the innocent creator making things, and I'm sympathetic to it because as a game developer, I get it. Have I worked in a AAA environment? No, but I get the creative liberations and the risk you take in partnering up with certain companies, and it is easier to scapegoat the publisher, whether it be for quality measurements or so on and so forth. But when you hear that there is that level of creative freedom that Phil reemphasizes ad nauseum in this interview, and then I hear that Arcane pretty much, I feel, had the option to go and do something that I would say effectively played to their strengths. Not that they couldn't make a multiplayer game, but I think that kind of hybrid approach of what Deathloop did was the furthest they should have gone, but they went all the way with Redfall. And I think it bit them in the butt. Now, is it cool that they got to make the thing they wanted to make? Yes, but it didn't pay off at all. And we'll get a little bit deeper into this conversation on how Xbox missed this one. But for now, let's talk a bit about with Phil and how they view the publishing business of things for Xbox and just the nature of Redfall being at a 62 over on Open Critic and, and how it's just things go that way sometimes, I guess. We will build games that review in the high 80s and we will review, we will build games that review in the 60s. I mean, it's just kind of part of being in game publishing. And if if you're afraid of that, then you shouldn't be in the entertainment business. You shouldn't be in the games business. That said, every time we deliver something below our own internal expectations that surprises us, 
um, we should check our process. I found this response disappointing on two different areas. Number one, I don't think you should just say, oh, it's part of the business that we're gonna publish games in the 60s. And quietly so, there's another Xbox exclusive in Ravenlock that has been reviewing pretty lower. And indie games sometimes do rate a little bit lower because there's fewer reviews. So, you know, that the metric can swing up and down pretty quickly, but Ravenlock reviewed pretty low. Then you get something like Redfall, which also reviewed very low as we've now seen, but that one a little bit of a heavier skew given the fact that there are 70 plus critic reviews on Open Critic for this one. You know, I feel like when you're the platform provider and you have the resources of Microsoft and not, I know Phil's not asking for sympathy, but I don't really feel sympathetic to the argument of, well, that's the game's publishing business. You should just go make games if, if that's something that's not for you. Um, I, I, I get that he again takes accountability and says that when we under deliver like that, we got to check our process. I think it's important they recognize that, but the reality is that that moment came and went to me with Crackdown 3. That moment came and went with some other Xbox One games that were missing. Uh, I think Rise Son of Rome, while I love it, didn't review spectacularly well as a launch game, for example. I, I think there were a lot of moments Xbox had the opportunity to analyze their pipeline, and especially when you brought in a new family member in Bethesda and you're planning on to still try to bring in one more in Activision, I find it disappointing that, again, you're kind of saying, oh, we, we got to analyze our pipeline. It's like that time came and went. This shouldn't have been a thing. I, I hope it doesn't happen again, truly. I hate to be that hard ass, but I don't understand why this was a process we had to check in the first place. Does this mean that every game Xbox will release should be 80 plus. I mean, I would hope so. We've seen uh, other publishers manage to hit a certain quality bar through a certain pipeline, through a certain process. I don't know why it's unfathomable to put that expectation on Xbox. And I think for a lot of people, the reason they don't want to is because they find it unrealistic. And Xbox is kind of buying into that mindset of like, yeah, sometimes we're going to put out a 60. It's like, no, let's not set the floor for ourselves. Like, let's set the floor at 80, 80 minimum. You got to set a standard. And not that they haven't, because I think Xbox Game Studios, we'll talk about that more tomorrow in that video, has published some really good games. Um, so the quality has gone up, but I don't think kind of shoulder shrugging and saying, ah, you know, sometimes you do get a 60 is, is right. And that, you know, the process should have been established, which he seems to know as well as anyone on that. So maybe I'm just barking up the wrong tree, but this was one of the first responses I found a little disappointing. That's not to de deny any of the animation, streaming of texture bugs, the AI bugs that we've seen, we will go work on those. But when I look at the review scores of this game, it's did we, did we have enough of creative differentiation in our core idea? Um, and did we realize that creative ambition? I'm a huge supporter of Arcane Austin. Their track record is awesome. I love a lot of the great games that they've built. This is one where the team didn't hit their own internal goals when it launched. I think it's maybe a little simplistic to just say, hey, if you would have just delayed it three months, the core creative of the game would have delivered on something that was different than what it was. Um, so I look at them at different camps. If there's a production timeline issue, we've been open to delaying. If we just have more bugs than we should have at the end of a game, we're, we, we're open to delaying. Um, at some point, we have to have a creative vision and put the game out and creator, uh, reviewers and players will tell us what they think. This answer was surprising to me because it, it does start to throw Arcane under the bus. And I, I wonder how much Phil and say, studio director Harvey Smith spoke before this interview because he talks about the creative vision more than the bugs and the glitches. Now it's good that they're gonna look into fixing these things and they're gonna hang with the game. And he does mention later on in this interview that uh, you know they're committing to the support and that there's gonna be a similar situation here to maybe like Sea of Thieves where they're gonna stick around and try to get this right. Now Sea of Thieves is one of Xbox's most played games, which is awesome to see. But Arcane didn't hit their own internal goals. I mean, that much is, I think, very obvious if you play the game. Uh, but to me, it's surprising to hear that in such close proximity to the launch because this doesn't necessarily grant people confidence to at least try the game via Game Pass. Now, if you watched my review, you know my score was don't download it on Game Pass, don't buy it, like nothing. Like, just don't play this game at all. It's just not what Arcane's known for and it's not a great game, not to beat a dead horse, but you know my score. But it's surprising to hear the head of Xbox pretty much affirm the thing that all the reviews were saying, which is, yeah, we just didn't hit the creative vision for the game, right? And that a delay wouldn't have fixed the problems with the game, that they 
seem to have recognized, which again, I think this kind of flies in the face of what was said earlier. Like, oh, we got to look at our pipeline. We got to be more careful with this game. We should have been more on top of it earlier, but then also recognizing, and by the way, he says after this, what their internal review score predictions were. And I never hire that company again, whoever did the mock reviews for you. But it sounds like on one end they were involved. And then on the other hand, it was just kind of like, we need to do better and be more involved in the pipeline. Again, it's that kind of convenient answer for the, the question that's being asked that I'm detecting and I hate to be that hard ass because that's not me. Y'all know how I approach my content, but I'm just seeing inconsistencies here. I'm glad they're hanging with it, uh, but, and I agree that the delay probably wouldn't have fixed the creative side of things, but on a polished level for a first party game, it just wasn't up to snuff. It's one thing if the creativity is not there, but if it worked and it felt a little smooth and more fun to play, I think some could have at least said try it on Game Pass. Maybe I would have even said that, but I didn't even think Redfall felt good to play. And especially when lots of aspects of it are broken, I understand the creative part was not up to snuff and that, you know, you would have had to overhaul the vision of the game in general to get it to that point. But polish wise, it just should have been better. And, and so I don't understand how that wasn't a factor, it sounds like. On the score, yeah, we do mock reviews for every game that we, we launch. And this is like double digits lower than we thought we would be um with this game went through our mock reviews this one i'll be quick on again i'll just say whoever the mock review company is for this never hire them again never if i'm xbox never the fact that they said double digits higher than where they thought they'd be like as in this was in the 70s 80s maybe even incredible 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 i was i'm not a number score review guy you know how i roll i think number scores are arbitrary and i feel like they are just a shortcut to a bad faith argument most times like why'd you give this a six and this a seven it's just there's got to be nuance in the conversations as games grow so does our talks on them but i was definitely sitting there thinking there's no way this goes above a 70. it just can't it's impossible um, so i don't know what they were playing, what they were seeing, if it was a specially curated build, because you know what we played during the preview in a lot of ways was different from what we were experiencing in the full game in the terms of, I'd say like world population was a significant difference. So I don't know if something changed in that, but yeah, that is insane that the metric was higher, which we've heard before that mock reviews sometimes score games higher internally than what they actually get so maybe they anticipated this a little bit but it seems like it's come as a bit of a surprise that this game scored as low as it did uh and again that's that's where i think yeah the internal process does need to be shored up and i understand phil's response on that 100 percent. but <laughs> double digits higher crazy in terms of our commitment to the game absolutely the team at arcane is on taking the near-term feedback. We're, we're still working on the 60 frames per second. Uh, we have a good timeline for that. We, we're, we're committed to getting that done. And we're gonna continue to, to work the game. I think we've we've shown a commitment to games like Sea of Thieves and, and like Grounded to continue to go and build games. But I also know that these games are $70 and I'm not gonna, like, I, I'm, I'm gonna take full responsibility for launching a game that needs to be great. You know, I think what I have with the Xbox community, what we have, what I am a part of um, is a team. There's still questions that pop every so often of how committed is the company to this category? When are we just going to push Xbox out of the market? Um, there's a lot of Twitter firing of Phil right now, which is fine. I'm, I'm way overpaid for the role I have anyway. So like, I get that's my responsibility. Um, but we will remain committed to the game and the players um, as long as the players want to go play games. Uh, and uh, that's my commitment to the community. Um, I'm kind of at a low point right now in terms of my delivery on that commitment to the community. Uh, but it, it very much stays. I want to support the team. And I want to support the creative ambitions of the teams. And I want to support the players. And uh, we let a lot of people down this week with the launch of the game. Um, but we will we will continue to strive on. You have to, right? That's just, that's what creative is about. So a lot of people have said, oh, Xbox fans are just doom and gloom. But the fact that Phil had to restate the commitment to Xbox in this clip here is insane. It speaks to the situation and how dire it is for this company that they're not going anywhere. Phil's affirming us of that. And I, I didn't think they were for what it's worth. I, you know, I didn't think Phil was going to lose his job or any of that stuff. I mean, the fact that they had to restate like, yeah, we're here and, and we're going to figure things out. <laughs> Just like this is heading into series console 
type of talk. And here we are in 2013 recommitting. Insane to see. Now, I'm glad they're going to hang with Redfall. I'm glad they got a good timeline for the 60 FPS fix. And, you know, the references to things like Sea of Thieves and Grounded hanging with them to make them better is great. But I'm glad he recognized, like, this is a $70 game. Like, this is... Even at 60, still unacceptable, but when you up to 70, I know it's to account for development costs and it doesn't mean that games are going to be bigger and in many cases better we've seen, but the reality is you're asking the consumer for more money and it just makes Game Pass, as I've said before, more appealing if you're delivering these quality games. Why not take the, put this in quotes, shortcut and go in there instead of spending 70 bones, right? So I'm glad he took responsibility for that and said there's no excuse. I agree, uh, but to commit to supporting this game, it's something I mentioned on Defining Duke, where I said that I don't think Xbox is going to drop this game. I, I assumed they were going to keep it stable, at least. But post-launch support, I, I didn't think they were really going to hang around and add a ton of content to it. We already know they're committing to two heroes for the game. That's part of their post-launch support package. But I'm curious if they're going to do more to try to restore what Redfall should have been. And if they do, I'll be there to check it out because I, I'm, I'd be curious because it's not a live service game by marketing definition. Uh, so I'm just curious if they shift into that at some point in time. Uh, we'll see. But on to the next clip. I'll even go back to the Redfall videos on IGN of showing videos of the game running at 60 on PC um, at the point knowing that the game was going to run 30 frames per second at launch on console. Like we have to be transparent about what we're showing, that what we're showing is representative of what our console customer, our most committed customer to our brand, financially committed, what they're going to see, what they're going to play. And that transparency just has to get better. Yeah, so this confirms that we were kind of lied to. Uh, I don't know how else to put it, that they, they knew that it wouldn't hit 60 on consoles at the time of showing gameplay at IGN. And by the way, well before that with trailers and everything at 60 frames but has urged the transparency needs to be better this is where i do think phil is a bit of falling on his sword um for other people because i again i i think again we'll talk about this more tomorrow but i, I think the people calling for phil's job are, are looking for someone easy to blame and i get the ideas it's very much like sports team energy where eventually you're going to go from head coach to the gm right and so I do think there's a degree of Phil falling on his sword here. And I know people want a finger to point, but this guy can only control and oversee so much. Not that I'm excusing him or what happened with Redfall, but I feel like something such as this, this is a message that should have been understood. And this is a marketing style message that should be a, a mantra moving forward. Like if it's 30, show it at 30. And, and we'll speak on Starfield at 30 because he does open up very subtly about that uh but you know this this type of transparency is something xbox has known for a while again i'm surprised it, it takes that yes we have to do better at this uh but they knew I, i'm very enthusiastic about showcase i'm i i we're gonna announce some things that people haven't seen some new games we're gonna give updates to some of the things that were on your list um the other thing that gets me really excited is when i look forward over the next quarters which has always been my focus of how do we get a big game out every quarter at quality um, that yeah. things are lining up finally after some of the slowdown through COVID. I'm tired of talking about that. Um, but I can now see that we've got games coming every quarter that I think will surprise and delight um, our customers. We still have to deliver on the creative. We still have to deliver on the technical. So this clip is really significant because I have a list here of the games that were mentioned earlier in the show uh, that Phil is talking about in regards to the showcase where it was brought up Perfect Dark, Everwild, Fable, State of Decay 3, Contraband, Hellblade 2. Uh, and he mentions that Xbox finally has things lined up where they can finally get big games out every quarter. And this is one of my theories on Defining Duke. Um, and I believe I shared it on this channel as well. I said that, you know, when it comes to Xbox, we've heard for a while, big AAA game every quarter. And when you look at this year, you have Hi-Fi Rush and Q1. Minecraft Legends can count, but it wasn't a full $60 game. So Redfall is that big, I know, don't say it, premium AAA game in Q2. Q3 would be Starfield if it actually does release, which it should in September. And my prediction is Q4 is Hellblade 2, right? And then it sounds like something such as Avowed can move into Q1 or Contraband can move into Q1 2024. Uh, but 
The reality is that is a list of games that have been announced for a while that we know very little on. Contraband, Hellblade 2, we've seen at least a decent amount, but Perfect Dark, Everwild, Fable, State of Decay 3. If I were to cherry pick games out of this list, I imagine he's talking about Contraband, Hellblade 2, and maybe Fable. Obviously, every game gets developed at a different pace, but Perfect Dark sounds like it's a mess. I'll be shocked that that shows up. Everwild, an even bigger mess. I think that's way further down the timeline. State of Decay 3, I'm less concerned about based off people I've spoken to at the team. And then that kind of leaves you with Fable. And I feel like given the time it was revealed in 2020 versus now, it should be time to see it if it's going to be out within that next year. Uh, but one thing I talked about with this showcase, and, and we'll, of course, do our usual prediction show uh but one thing i talked about with this showcase is um you kind of have to have the now slightly in the future and the big future announcements so that to me would be something like the now is starfield the somewhat into the future is your avowed maybe like a fable and then your deep into the future is like genuinely a wow announcement such as new vegas 2 we'll say hypothetically like we're not going to get it for a while and elder scroll 6 like you're not going to get it for a while but it's a part of our plans moving into the future and i think that would get xbox some type of generated hype where it's like okay we have things coming soon we have things dated soon but down the line we also have new things to look forward to to, to buy into this ecosystem more even if we'll get into it phil doesn't seem to believe it'll get people to move from playstation to xbox which i don't think is the point but I'll save those bars for later. We've got Starfield coming. We've got Forza coming. We've got Hellblade coming. Like we've got collections of games. I'm seeing very good builds of Avowed and stuff like uh, we're in, like I can see it. Um, but until I, you have a controller in your hand and you're smiling from playing our games, none of my words should matter. So he's really urging us that things are coming into vision, right? Which is great. Um, I think that's very exciting. But I will just say that the main thing that stood out to me, and it's a bit of copium hopium mixture here, but he did say collections of a game. And I feel like it's got to be Gears. Like the, the reality check in me says Gears, but there's another part of me that says it's it's got to be Fallout. It's got to be Fallout, right? Gears makes so much sense with the legacy of that game series to the Xbox ecosystem and how Master Chief Collection sort of begs a Marcus Phoenix Collection to exist. But Fallout 3, New Vegas Collection on modern consoles, I mean, mm, not a bad idea. But with Starfield coming out, you, you gotta wonder a bit. I think a Gears Collection makes a lot more sense, especially since it's been reported numerous times. That, to me, was the most exciting thing, because I feel like the way he kind of laid it out there, we've got Starfield, we got Forza, we got Hellblade 2, collections of games, great builds of Avowed. To me, as he laid that out, because he's talking about the pipeline here and how even though it shouldn't matter until folks are actually playing it, he can see it coming. And to me, this sounds like a f sort of similar situation to what we were getting in 2021 where we got Psychonauts, we got Age of Empires 4, then we got Forza Horizon 5, and then we got Halo Infinite, right? And the, it was like back to back to back to back. This sounds to me like starting in, you know, September with Starfield, it's going to be a month to month thing. Starfield, Forza, Hellblade 2, a collection, then maybe January avowed. I mean, it just sounds like we're going to get hammered by the, the end of this year, uh, which is something I was a little bit nervous about. But I mean, I think again, Xbox fans will happily feast. I just worry about it because I feel like when you shotgun blast everything out, we don't know what else is in the can that isn't years off like your Everwilds and your Perfect Darks. Maybe they're closer than we think, who knows? Uh, but on the assumption that they're not, it's like once you shotgun blast all of these out, then we're back to that same drop. And we didn't do a good job early on in engaging with Arcane Austin to really help them understand what it meant to be part of Xbox and part of first party and use some of our internal resources uh, to to help them and, and kind of move along that journey even faster. So we kind of left them to go work on the game. They're a very talented team. I love that team and I still do. And I will totally bet on them to do another great game. Um, but when I like Matt Booty and Jamie Leader who's running ZeniMax and I sit down, I think we can engage earlier. We did a better job with Starfield. Again, nobody should believe it until they're playing the game, but that game was earlier on in production um, and it was easier for us to kind of swarm a bunch of people to go and kind of help with some of the technology on our platform and in ensure that we're gonna ship a, a quality experience there. And we should have been there for Harvey and the team earlier. I, I think that's on, on us. And then through the process, 
you know, it's an Unreal game. We have a bunch of studios that have done some really great work on Unreal over the years. And I think we were too late to, to help in that when they had certain issues that they were working through, which any team will, it's nothing to do with the specific engine. Um, but we have a lot of experience and we, we needed to get on that earlier with the team. So Starfield, sounds like they're more hands-on with this one. So it sounds like even though he's taken responsibility for Redfall, that this is really on Xbox. And it's interesting to say that Starfield was earlier on in production than Redfall because uh, it, to our knowledge, Starfield has been in production for a long, long, long time. Yeah, with Arcane, it's it's sad to see that Redfall is the situation I had predicted on Defining Duke, that I had predicted on this channel, that fear of Redfall had to walk so Starfield could run, right? Because now the urgency is kicked in. We got it. Nail Starfield. There's only so much you can change in a right now four month window, so much you can polish up in that short amount of time, at least based off my knowledge of game development. It's only so much you can do, but there seems to be a greater sense of urgency on that. And not that it would have fixed the creative issues with Redfall, but you can't help but wonder what could have been if there was more hands on involvement. And I understand why you'd trust Arcane Austin. Like, again, this is why there was any type of excitement for a game out of the pocket of Arcane Austin, because when you look at Dishonored and Prey and what they've delivered and even Deathloop to many, you know, high quality stuff, you know, what is the worry, right? So I understand why you feel you could turn your back to them. Well, Bethesda Game Studios is just coming off of Fallout 76 and you're like, let's make sure you're going to get things right here, especially because there's so much hype around this game. So I get why there was a focus by Xbox, but it's good to know that the teams are coming in and helping Arcane uh, because they are working with Unreal Engine and that Unreal Engine experience does pay off for Xbox. We've seen this before. I mean, I think Coalition did the Matrix demo for Unreal Engine 5. So it's good to see that now they're helping, but I hope they're really involved with that next project from Arcane. That's all I'm saying. I feel like they owe it to them at this point. Should Xbox players expect a clear message this summer with Starfield with 30 and 60 frames? That's a big lesson learned as you brought up. Should we expect that answer as clear as day? Yeah, that was simple. So we're going to get answers on it. I will be happy if it's 60 frames, but I just, you look at the scale and the scope and what this game's doing, and I wonder if it could. Uh, you know, Starfield is a game that we've seen teased from Todd multiple times that, you know, they don't really worry too much about the frame rate. And so if they got to do that to get the simulation live is what he called, then they may drop some frames. And I don't know if people are ready for that conversation in such close proximity just a month later uh, after Redfall's release. But at least we'll get clarity months in advance and people can make the proper adjustments or just not play at all. Uh, but I don't anticipate it to be good news. But we are not in a position, and I, I see it out there, I see commentary that if you just build great games, everything would turn around. It's just not true that if we go off and build great games, all of a sudden you're gonna see console share shift in some dramatic way. We lost the worst generation to lose in the Xbox One generation where everybody built their digital library of games. Um, so when you go and you're building on Xbox, we want our Xbox community to feel awesome. But this idea that if we just focused more on great games on our console, that somehow we're going to win the console race, I think doesn't really lay into the reality of most people, like 90% of the people every year who walk into a retailer to buy a console are already a member of one of the three ecosystems. I see a lot of pundits out there that kind of want to go back to the time where we all had cartridges and discs and every new generation was a clean slate and you could switch the whole console share. That's just not the world that we are in today. There is no world where Starfield's an 11 out of 10 and people start selling their PS5s. It's not gonna happen. Yeah, like I don't know how else to put it other than hard disagree across the board on, on many aspects of this. There's one thing I should say though that is true that it's a really good point in perspective that they did lose a very important generation in the Xbox One where people were building up their digital libraries. But that doesn't mean that people weren't already doing that on the Xbox One in the first place. Like there was no console at all. Uh, just because you lost the race in that doesn't mean that people weren't building up their digital libraries. But we do live in a day and age now where you have two SKUs. One's the more value package in the Series S. The other is the more expensive premium product in the Series X. You have Game Pass on multiple devices where 
I understand Xbox's goal is to really sell Game Pass subscriptions, but the idea is gaming has grown for so many people where yes, most people do have that decision made of like, I'm just using one console. But without a doubt, in my mind, people would pick up an Xbox if Starfield, Avowed, and Hellblade delivered. All together, I just think there's no denying this would move units. And it's not about getting people to sell a PS5. It's about getting people to just try Game Pass. It's about getting people to buy an Xbox. That's what it's about, Phil. And I'm sure he understands that, but the, all I'm hearing here is like, even if Starfield's incredible, it's not gonna change much for us. What? Are you serious? You don't think that if you start delivering incredible games, it's not gonna boost your platform? I'm not saying you gotta beat PlayStation, you gotta beat Nintendo, but you've put yourself in third place in this interview and said, yeah, it's gonna be that way, so it doesn't matter. We're just gonna go at it our own way and just me measure our own success personally, which is what I've said for a while. Xbox is not an unsuccessful brand. Just when you compare them to PlayStation and Nintendo, it is frustrating, but make no mistake, you can be there if you choose to. And yes, delivering games like Starfield at a quote, 11 out of 10, end quote, and Hellblade at that rate, and Avowed at that rate. Make no mistake, people will start to say, I can't get that on my PlayStation, just like what's happening now. I can't get this on my Xbox when I look at Ghost of Tsushima, God of War, Spider-Man, Wolverine, and the list goes on, KOTOR remake, the now and into the future. I always talk about, right? Ratchet and Clank. They go, oh, I can't get that on my Xbox. I'm gonna go pick up a PlayStation exclusives drive console sales, which I know, even though Phil is recommitted in this interview to console sales, make no mistake that their focus is on PC. That much is evident with the new PC Game Pass trial, them saying we're trying to focus on growing Game Pass on PC, strictly because they feel like they've plateaued a bit with growth of Game Pass on console. So he can say what he wants, but the actions and the numbers are saying other things. And there's no doubt in my mind that if these games do deliver, people would buy Xbox consoles and that we would see the hardware sales go up from the 30% plummet we just saw from the last quarter. Again, I know they're trying to move subscription services, but if that's your goal, great games are going to help move that too, not just games existing. So that's my thoughts on everything that Phil had to say in this interview. A great interview by the boys over at Kind of Funny. Shout out to the X-Cast, a great group of guys there. Um, they do excellent work, and this was certainly a great great bit of insight. So shout out to Phil for the transparency. But again, these are just my thoughts on the matter. I'm looking forward to hearing yours. Thank you so much for tuning in to a pretty meaty long-term video. And again, I'm looking forward to your thoughts. With that, take great care of yourselves and I will see you next time around. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below. And a big thank you to all the patrons, all the members who continue to support the hell out of the content here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.